All right, gang, let's uh, change gears a bit and let's talk about that less fortunate patient, that patient who presents with metastatic colorectal cancer, who has too many METs or the wrong location for resection. Um, we have new tools. I think back, uh, we all know the story. We start with 5-FU, we pray, and finally heaven delivers or in a TCAN oxaliplatin, capecitabine, BEV, uh, cetuximab, panitumumab, and you know, with that change, we made some significant leaps. But I always joke that we were partying so hard we didn't hear when heaven's door shut, um, and no medicines between 2005 and really 2012, despite some effort to try and develop new medicines. And all around us, you know, all the other cancers, new medicines that I don't even know the names of, and that that you know that have been developed. Um, and I was becoming increasingly jealous again. And then finally some new medicines uh, that emerge. One thing we did learn during that interval was the important lessons around biology, particularly around KRAS. Heinz, teach us a little bit about this. I know most of our audience has heard about this, but there's some newer information, some subtle differences that are, we're thinking about. What's the state of the art today on KRAS? Yeah, so I think we, we have made significant progress. It's a very exciting time that we can use molecular testing in our tumors to identify what drugs will or will not work. And I think the only predictive marker we have in our clinic validated is KVAS, a mutation in an oncogene which is in the MAP kinase pathway, plays a significant role in the efficacy of EGF receptor inhibitors. I think this is the right start to begin molecular profiling and really tailoring chemotherapy. I was always shocked we have a targeted treatment, but we do not target the right patients. And I think this is the first step in the right direction. I'm sure that a lot of new genes and profiles will follow. But you know, we, there are mistakes in this. We are new in that in order testing it, because the question is when do we test? Should we do it right away? It takes time. And we thought in the beginning, Every KVAS mutation is the same, it doesn't matter, and maybe we are wrong. And we have learned the lesson in CHIST that mutation exon 9 and 11 in CKIT are not the same. It's impacting the prognosis and the dosing. And we think maybe that may go on with KVAS. The spectrum may matter. If you have an exon 12 or 13 mutation, we will learn now that when you treat in wild type, some of these patients suddenly have a KVAS mutation. The question is, do they acquire it or are these cells growing out? Which actually addresses one of the biggest technology uh, limitations. Do we do the right test? Are the tests we have sensitive enough and how many cells should um, carry a KVAS mutation and how is that clinically important. So right now, I think it's a very valuable test because it makes right now a decision in first line available for um, treatment with each F receptor inhibitors. Um, and I think we will learn now with all the large trials in phase, in phase three in first line, we will can answer if the spectrum will impact the outcome and the predictive value. Well, so let me pick on you. So BMS with the crystal data comes out with also a new molecular test for KRAS, so we were happily going along measuring it through a variety of labs, and they come out with now an FDA-approved test. In your center, what's going on? With yeah, that? so I think th there is a lot of changes happen in the U.S., and you know, until now, CLIA-approved labs were absolutely comfortable in order to offer molecular testing, and we can do it. But if you want to go and register new treatments, FDA will be involved in the approval of a molecular test. So that is a change which we have not seen before, but it also reflects a lot of new discoveries in order to streamline and oversee the validity of this test and to standardize them even more than with the clear. Johanna, a patient comes in with a lot of money, we don't have to worry about insurance, and they say, mm -hmm. I have a 13D mutation and I want you to give me cetuximab. What's the answer? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Show me the money. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. 
<laughs> spend it on something else, like yeah. a car. Should, <laughs> should, should I yeah. uh, receive this medicine? Well, so it's interesting because now we have conflicting data. We mm. were very, very excited when mm. we originally saw the pooled analysis from the crystal and opal study showing us that potentially the G13D mutant patients received just as much benefit as the wild type KRAS patients from Cetuximab. But then all of a sudden last year, we got some data from the Peters trial, from mm. uh, Mark Peters, that actually suggested with a panitumumab-based trial that maybe it's not. And so right now, I think it also just pushes the fact that we don't understand. Or is there some other component to the G13D mutant patients that's happened a subcategory mm -hmm. um, that might receive benefit or not? So what I would probably recommend to that patient is not to do that and to try something else like a clinical trial. Yeah, so Very one good. thing I think we've been really irresponsible as GI oncologists is we've been making sort of dogma-like statements with small data sets. And one place I think we've been guilty, and I'm just as much as anybody else is around BRAF, we just downstream, uh, an important <laughs> marker that's going to be important to measure, I think, in all colorectal cancer patients. You know, one, one day we're saying, you know, if you're BRAF mutated, then you should never receive an EGFR. We soften our stance a year later. Axel, teach us about what today's <laughs> standard is around BRAF and how you use that in your clinic. So BRAF, as you said, in our bubble diagrams and PowerPoint slides, one step below KRAS, and we, we think, you know, just looking at this stepwise idea of, you know, how cell signaling works, you know, this should be more or less the same phenotype as in, in implication for clinical practice as KRAS. It's not. I mean, it's clearly not. And number one, it's a smaller subgroup. It's only about 8% of patients that have BRAF mutations in the metastatic setting. Uh, number two, it really, it, it really downstream induces a very different gene expression pattern. Actually, very nice data from Sabine Tetchpar's group, KRAS gene expression, KRAS mutant tumors gene expression levels, BRAF mutant tumors, they are completely different. It's completely different biology. And what the highlight of BRAF mutant tumors is, is a very poor prognosis. If we have one group of patients with colorectal cancer that is a kind of a defined group by molecular characteristics and prognosis, it's actually the BRAF mutant tumors. Group. Yeah, do you buy this argument around microsatellite instability in BRAF? I mean, you know, there, yeah. is some, there is some interaction, yeah. but mainly in the early stage setting, so that the microsatellite instable tumors, which have a higher rate of BRAF mutations, this kind of good prognosis versus bad prognosis factors can offset each other some. But when you talk about the metastatic setting right now, this is a patient that will crash, and we really don't have any standard therapies um, for this patient. We, we looked at this at the BRAF in the combined crystal and opus uh, data and presented it as, at meetings here. And what came clear, yeah, prognostic factor. So we, if, and the, the reason why I'm not using it as a test or not, why I'm not testing it is then I have to tell my patient, oh, you have a very poor prognosis, but I can't do anything about that. But, but and the likelihood that you will still respond on cetuximab is there. I mean, the, the data were not completely negative. There was a trend in the, in the direction of that these patients also benefit. So this is why I, at the moment, think it's not ready for, for a widespread use. Actually. But you know, I think it, it, it opens up a completely new world of understanding yes. because we thought this is all clear cut. The first publication on BWAF in high impact journals showed resistance to each receptor inhibitor. They didn't even know the prognosis yet. I think we are learning. And I think a dimension which comes new to colon cancer is the immunotherapies. BWAF mutants have a completely different response to immunotherapies than others. So I think we are going to understand much more and these patients need different treatments. So do you test everyone with BRAF? Everyone. Do you? Yeah, I do. And Me I think too. this is yeah. the biggest signal that we have to send out there to the people that we're talking to is that for those patients, you should test because if they are BRAF mutant, you've got to direct them to a clinical trial because there are I, agents the out part. there that, now that's, that's the important where part, we're specifically yeah. looking yeah. at. Well, let's go there. But the drugs that are targeting BRAF, you know, they haven't played out like they're playing out so, in Illinois, uh, so, right? <laughs> so, so, so I wanted to go back to Henning because I think you need to know. So I had a patient a couple of months ago, BWAF mutant, metastatic disease. She had two days of headaches. Usually I would not do an MRI scan. I said, take some ibuprofen. I did and there were pain lesions. So I think for monitoring and identifying this more aggressive and patients who have unusual metastasis, I think it will help. Now, I also think that we thought, oh my God, it's like in melanoma. We have a BWAF mutation. We inhibit it and everything will be fine. Obviously, colon cancer is more complex, and we now know from preclinical models, and a lot of, of us are involved in this, we need to combine. It's not a single drug 
activity. We need the AKT inhibitors. We need the EGF receptor inhibitors. There is actually EGF receptor coming back as a yep. very important combination partner. So I think we are learning sometimes the hard way, but I think we are going forward in the right direction. Johanna, as somebody who develops drugs in this world, why have we gotten so unlucky? I, I look at the lung cancer group and, you know, they trip over crizotinib and it works very well. Their EGFR drugs work very well. You go to the breast cancer groups, their HER2 drugs work very well. Ours work not so well. Yep. Why are we struggling so much, you think? I think it's not as much that we're struggling, but we're behind in the race. I think we're just starting, and we keep using this metaphor to scratch the surface. I think we're just starting to learn for colorectal cancer patients who's different and how we should start to direct the therapies. So I think that though we don't have an ALK mutation yet, though there might be one hiding out there. And don't forget the ALK mutant patients are only, you know, single digit percentage right. patients. So it might be that we just, you know, treat, more, we will end up with the mutation that takes care of more patients. Yeah. You gotta look on the bright side of life. <laughs> but I think we're, <laughs> but I think where we are right now is just starting to realize that all of these patients are different. And, and I know Heinz has done quite a bit of work looking at this. Um, can we start to define um, who's going to recur and for what reasons and then start to separate these patients out into boxes? And I think that we're actually going to turn into breast cancer okay. um, at some point in time. And we're going to have um, a triple negative EGF, IGF positive patient that's going to receive drug X, Y, and Z. But it's just figuring it out. And I certainly argue that we need more funding. And so for all those people who are out there doing it with their pink ribbons on and their walks and races <laughs> for the cure, brown ribbons, put them on. Blue, and, blue, um, blue, 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 blue. Brown blue, ribbons. Blue. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, so you don't want to stick with <laughs> I'll get those brown ribbons yet. Okay. We have a lot of choices.